First Timothy chapter two, verse four. The apostle Peter writes, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. So we continue our series, Exiles in Our Land, standing as God's people with God's people. Now today, those two parts of our identity as Christians come through strong in the text. Because we are God's people in the Messiah Jesus, we belong together. Together, we are a spiritual house, says Peter. Now, how is identity formed? Have you thought about this? Say that there was someone you knew in an earlier part of your life, but you haven't seen them in a long time, 10, 15 years. And then you see them and you go, wow, they became a totally different person. Perhaps you knew him from childhood when he was short and skinny, but now he's tall and 220 pounds of lean muscle. He won't eat pizza with you anymore. Only chicken breasts. He doesn't have to tell you that he goes to the gym six times a week. It is obvious. His clothes, his lingo, his diet, it all spells fitness. Fitness is his thing. Or maybe she, when you check out her Facebook page or connect with her over coffee, she only talks politics, policies, rallies, candidates, hot issues, elections. You're like, okay, I care, but not like this. So you see the distance between you and that person, the distance of time allows you to see clearly the things, the influences that have shaped their identity. We all do this. We may do it along family lines, vocational lines, ideological lines, and there are all kinds of things that shape our identity. Some go deeper than others. A lawyer may speak a certain way, dress a certain way, drive a certain car, live in a certain neighborhood, vacation in certain places. So there's a whole persona they take on. But another lawyer may not conform to any of the lawyerly stereotypes. Law to them is just their vocation. It's not their identity. Okay, here's why this matters. In this letter, Peter, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, is deepening our understanding of our identity as God's people and with God's people. He knows that Rome, Rome has certain values and priorities that inform and form people's daily choices. And that was true 2,000 years ago, and it's the same today. For example, high school seniors often graduate from high school and from faith simultaneously. Now, how does that happen? Well, as they're becoming adults, they realize, you know, this Christian thing was my parents' faith, but it wasn't really mine. So I'm going to explore and see if there's something else that suits me better. And we all know there are a lot of things on offer. And so people decide, you know, I'm going to jettison Christianity or I'm going to keep it, but kind of in the background as something nice and small, or they decide I am a Christian. My Christian faith is the principle by which everything else in life makes sense. That last option is what Peter is after. He's after deepening our understanding, helping us form our identity as Christians, a deeper Christian identity. 
And so we're going to look today at two things that he continues building on. First, come to the living stone. Come to the living stone. We read again in verse 4 of chapter 2, as he says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Okay, so in chapter 1, uh, as he is explaining the, just the radical nature of Christian conversion, Peter used the image of new birth, right? New birth. Now, when people join secret societies or a club or a team, they're usually initiated. There's some kind of initiation, rite or ritual. Christian conversion is far more radical than joining some kind of club. No, it's a new birth by the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, the gospel. Now, you may say, well, what about baptism? Isn't baptism the initiation right into the Christian faith? Yes, it is. But it's only a physical symbol of that inward new birth that you've experienced. So it's far more radical. So that was in chapter 1. Well, now in chapter 2, he uses a new image. And that's this image of a living stone. He says that Jesus is the living stone, and Christians are living stones. Now, we'll get to the Christian part in a bit. But why does he call Jesus the living stone? Well, going back to the law of Moses, the Lord God was called the rock, or a rock. Uh, in the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, God is called the rock five times. I'll read you some of the references. Deuteronomy 32, verse 3. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect. Then in verse 15, Jeshurun, that is Israel, grew fat and kicked, filled with food. They became heavy and sleek. They abandoned the God who made them and rejected the rock, their savior. Verse 18, you deserted the rock, who fathered you, you forgot the God who gave you birth. And so then, you know, later on, uh, many, many, many years later, uh, we read in Psalm 28, verse 1, uh, phrases like this, To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. So God is the rock. Now, when we come to the ministry of Jesus... Uh, when he takes his disciples to the north of Israel, to Caesarea Philippi, it's a very important time in his ministry. He begins to ask them what people say about him, about who he is, and they give all kinds of answers all wrong. And then he turns to them and says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, by revelation of the Spirit, says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The rock on which the church is built is the confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of the living God. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says of Israel's wanderings in the wilderness, listen to what he says in chapter 10. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Do you hear that? This goes all the way back to the years in the desert. And he says, the rock there that was nourishment to them was who? Christ, Jesus. Now, there are other Old Testament texts that speak of a very important stone, a very important stone, and there are three of them that Peter quotes here. We read them at the beginning. I'm going to read them to you again, but I'm going to read you the Old Testament version. This is what Peter is quoting. So, we have Psalm 118, the verses which read, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Isaiah 8. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And then Isaiah 28. 
So this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. So these are the three different texts in the Old Testament that Peter quotes here. Now, let's look at what Jesus does with some of the, one of these texts in his ministry. Whenever we read an, a New Testament passage of scripture that quotes a lot of verses from the Old Testament, we're reading to read the Old Testament Christologically. That is with Christ at the center. That's how the apostles read the Old Testament. They learned it from Christ. So, in the ministry of Jesus, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is a parable of great import. It's a parable that Jesus tells toward the end of his life, just days before he is killed. And it's the parable of the tenants. Now, how does the parable of the tenants go? Do you remember? A landowner plants a vineyard, rents it to some tenants, and goes away. Then at harvest time, he sends servants to come and collect his share of the crop. But the tenants beat the one, killed the other, and stoned a third. The landowner sends more servants to collect. They do the same. And so finally, the landowner sends his son, thinking they will respect my son. But the tenants are wicked. And so rather, they say, this is the heir. Let's kill him and keep the inheritance. So that's the parable. And then Jesus asked the question of his audience. What will the landowner do to these tenants? And they say, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. And he will take the vineyard and give it to other tenants who will give him the share of the crop at harvest time. And then Jesus says, have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. And then he drops the hammer. Therefore, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He says this in the temple courts of Jerusalem, addressing the chief priests and the elders of Israel. And there were two things that he did with that parable that completely bypassed them. First, notice that he ends the parable with the landowner's son being killed. And we now know, of course, that Jesus was just days from being killed. And second, he quotes Psalm 118. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The sun, listen, the sun is the stone the builders rejected. And yet God made him the cornerstone. That was Jesus. And so now Peter says, everyone stands or stumbles on this stone. Everyone the world over stands or falls on this stone. Jesus is the precious stone. He was chosen by God and precious to him. There is no one in the whole universe more precious to God than Jesus Christ. But he's also the rejected stone. The rejected stone. You know, we read here that he was rejected. Peter says he's rejected by humans. All the way going back to Psalm 118, there was a prophecy of some builders in this building project. And there's a stone lying on the ground. And it, they overlook it. They bypass it. It's of no use or consequence to them. But then, you know, the question is, why? Why are they rejecting this stone? Why is this one who's so important to God is so unimportant to humans? And the answer is because we don't have God's vision. We don't have the things of God in mind. We don't see the way that God sees. And so Jesus is the precious stone. He's also the rejected stone. And he's also the stumbling stone. In rejecting Jesus, many stumble. Peter says, a stone that causes many to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. Why do they stumble? Because they refuse to obey the message. They disobey the message from God. 
Now, the good news is that Jesus, the living stone, the precious stone, is not only precious to God. He's also precious to those who believe. In verse 7, Peter says, now to you who believe, this stone is is precious. And so, as the precious living stone, we are called to come to him. Come to him. And so that's the call to all of us today. Come to him. Come to him above all sin. Come to him above all that your heart holds dear. Come to him above all the good gifts of the world. Come to him above all the kingdoms and riches of the world. We are called to come to the living stone, the Son of God, our rock and Savior. And as you come to him, embrace his people. As you come to him, embrace his people. Read with me once again verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, Rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you are not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You see, it's not enough for you to say, Jesus, the living stone, is precious to me. Peter would say to you, show it. Show it by the way you live. Show it by the building project that you are most committed to with your life. You see, there are only two building projects going on in all the world at any given time. God's building project and humanity's building project. Let me give you a couple of examples. When God asked Noah to build the ark, everybody laughed. Everybody laughed. They're like, "Uh, okay, Noah, where's the water? Is this a good old case of if you build it, rain will come? So God was engaged in a building project through Noah, but the people rejected it. They laughed. Now, conversely, uh, in Genesis 11, when humanity is building this tower, right? Uh, the, The Tower of Babel, this tower they want to go up to the heavens, God was not in it. And so God comes down and puts a stop to it. So those are two different examples there. Now, in Psalm 118, it says the stone the builders rejected. So again, the picture is of these builders, and they are engaged in this building project. And as they are on site, and many of you have been in construction sites. That's where you live. I mean, our building has kind of been a construction site in the last few months. There's a stone, and there's a stone there that gets overlooked, gets passed over by the architects and builders. They have no use for it whatsoever. But then the psalm says the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. This is the Lord's doing. Do you see? So listen. God has his own building project in the midst of humanity's building project. And God, in his building project, places a living stone in Zion. And that is his son, his king. And everyone who looks to him, everyone who trusts in him, will never be put to shame. And if you trust in this living stone, in Christ, then you become a living stone. Do you see? You become a living stone. You are, we are God's building project. We are being built. It's, Peter says we're being built into a spiritual house. Now, what this means is that God is not engaged in building a temple of stone in Jerusalem or anywhere else in the world. He is rather building a spiritual temple, a spiritual house. And every Christian is a stone, a brick on that house. And so making the Lord Jesus the cornerstone, the most important stone, is God's doing. And building us into God's spiritual house is also God's doing. And so then Peter gives us five descriptions, 
five descriptions of what this spiritual house is like. And we're just going to walk through them briefly. So we are a holy priesthood, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and God's special possession. Let's look at each of those. I know that this lesson is a little bit theologically deep, right? I just need you to keep tracking with me because when you come to a text of scripture that has so many quotations from the Old Testament, we have to understand what's going on, right? So are you hanging tight? Yes? Okay, good. Here we go. A holy priesthood. In verse 5, he says, we are a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now listen, the early Christians were seen as weird. They were seen as weird by Roman religion and by, by Jewish religion. Why were they seen as weird? Because in Roman religion and even in Jewish religion, before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, all of the, these religions had temples, animal sacrifices, and priests. And the Christians had none of these. They had no temples, no animal sacrifices, and no priests. And so the Romans struggled. I mean, you can read the literature. They struggled to understand, how do you worship? What are you doing in your worship gatherings? And so Peter is writing here to give us a deeper identity and give them a deeper identity as Christians, but also to help them answer those from the outside when they ask questions. And so Peter here is saying, Jesus is the living stone who was rejected, killed by the people, but God made him the cornerstone. He raised him from the dead. And now he's building a worldwide spiritual temple. It's a worldwide spiritual temple. So actually, we do have a temple and sacrifices and priests, but they're not like other religions. It's a spiritual religion. All Christians are a priesthood. All Christians are a temple. All Christians offer sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices to God. So listen, when we gather together, as we're doing right here, to lift high the name of the living stone, Jesus Christ. And that happens the world over. God's spiritual temple is growing. And when we don't engage in slander, deceit, malice, hypocrisy, the various things that Pastor Blaine called spiritual junk food last week, when we don't engage in those things, the holiness of our priestly duties to God is growing. And when we care for the poor and abstain from sexually degrading behavior and love people who insult us, We are offering spiritual sacrifices to God made acceptable through Jesus Christ. Do you see? So we are a temple. We are a priesthood. We do offer sacrifices, but it's all our lives. So we are a holy priesthood. We're also a chosen people. A chosen people or a chosen race. Now, this is remarkable. Peter here is using language from Isaiah 43. We did this like over two months ago where God says to Israel, I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself that they may proclaim my praise. Peter quotes the last part of this uh, verse in, uh, in, in verses 9 and 10. So look at what Peter is doing. He's applying language, promises, scriptures that belong to the exiles in Babylon, language of deliverance, and he now applies it to the Christians, to all the Christians around the world. He says, God called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. At one point, you were in the exile of darkness. We've been talking about this, but now he's brought you into his wonderful light. At one point, you were not his people, you Gentiles, but now you are his people. People And so God's chosen people today are the Christians from all over the world, Jew and Gentile. This is why Christians read the Old Testament, right? You and I do this. We read the Old Testament with promises, wonderful promises that God makes to Israel, but we read them like they're for us because they are. Where do we get that from? Peter and the other apostles read the scriptures, the, the, the Old Testament scriptures, which was their Bible. That's how they read them, because they learned it from Jesus. 
This is why Old Testament and New Testament is ours. Now, the early Christians saw themselves as a new race. Sometimes they called it a third race. So not Jew, not Gentile, a third race. And this third race was made up of all nationalities. Okay? Elites and slaves, men, women, children, all belonged. And what unified this third race, this new race, this chosen people, what unified them was the blood of Christ. That's it. Only one thing unified this whole, this brand new race that was emerging in the world, and it was the blood of Christ. And therein you have the seed and the cure for all racism, classism, sexism, elitism. So, listen carefully. For this reason, it is utterly an insult to God when your dominant lens for viewing people in our country is Democrat or Republican. That's an insult to God. How will you treat or speak of the people in the other party on November 6th, the day after the election? Deceit, slander, malice, or patience, love, and kindness? We have to internalize this really carefully. Listen, Democrats and Republicans who trust in Jesus belong to a chosen race, a third race with a deeper affiliation to Jesus Christ that will outlast our nation. Listen, much to the chagrin of some, there will be Democrats and Republicans in heaven. <laughs> what are you going to do? Ask God to give you a different room? <laughs> this is what the new earth is going to be like. What runs deeper in you? The blood of Christ or the politics of your party? Listen, we are a third race. A chosen people. Next, we are a royal priesthood. Okay, so before Peter said we are a holy priesthood, now he says we are a royal priesthood. Holiness has to do with our being set apart for God. Royalty has to do with us belonging to God the King, belonging to God's kingdom. And priesthood has to do with our service standing in the middle, so to speak, between heaven and earth. That's what priesthood means, people. We stand in the middle between heaven and earth and we offer service to earth, to the world on behalf of God. And we offer service, praise to God on behalf of the world. And so we are a royal priesthood, which means that the church as an entity, I'm not talking about each of you as individuals, the church as an entity cannot be seen as either Democrat or Republican because it's already royal. Royal. Now, we have this fascination in our country with the royals, right? Are Harry and Meghan still royal? What did the royals have for breakfast? We're always thinking about these things. The true royals are right here. This is the true royalty. It's what this says. You are a royal priesthood. And so, as an entity, the church has already, its allegiance has already been set to the king of the universe. And this allegiance cannot be, is not up for grabs. And it cannot be manipulated into the service of any political agenda. This royal allegiance that we have to the king of the universe takes form in service to the world as we mediate the word of God and love those who are not a part of his kingdom. So we are a holy priesthood, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and now a holy nation. A holy nation. Now, some Christians think that America should be a holy nation. And it would be wonderful if America, or for that matter, China, and Russia, and Nigeria, and France, and every other country in the world were holy. But that's not what Peter is talking about. He's talking about the holy nation. The, the, na the, the nation that's in view here is this holy nation that are the Christians scattered in every nation. 
That's the holy nation he's talking about. The Christians that are scattered in every nation. So there's only one nation that God is building because God is involved in only one building project. There's only one holy nation God is building and it is not America. Rather, this holy nation is all of Christ's followers made up of Chinese, Russian, American, Japanese, Nigerian, French, and people from every other country and every other people group. And so, Christian nationalism, if there should be such a thing, does not mean, should not mean, that one country is God's country. But rather, it's the one nation, the one nation that has no geographical borders, that's made up of people from every single country, and that has no president or ruler except Christ. That nation is holy unto God by the blood of the Lamb. And that, brothers and sisters, is what the new earth is going to be like. And so if you think you're going to like heaven, you better start liking now the one nation made up of people from all over the world that has been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Can we praise God for this? It is extremely important. Listen. That does not mean that our nation, America, does not matter. It does mean that we must rightly calibrate the importance of God's building project and humanity's building project. And then finally, we are God's special possession. God's special possession. Listen, above all, above all things, God loves his son, Jesus. He loves his son, Jesus. And because we love his son because he's precious to us, we are precious to God. Do you see? God delights in his son. And because we delight in his son also, God delights in us. You know, a new sensation uh, came in for Anne and me over the last year or so as uh, we started observing someone that began to love one of our children like she and I Love them. We had never seen this before, but then Austin came into our daughter's life. They're now married. But as we started observing how Austin was loving her so selflessly and devotedly, this was something new to us. Our love for him grew. Before that, he meant nothing to us. Okay, that's too strong. That's too strong. He was like everybody else to us. But now, as we see how he loves the daughter that we love, we love him. Does that make sense? And it's the same for Christians. Jesus is precious to God. And because Jesus is precious to us, we are precious to God. And so Peter says, we were not God's people, but now we are his people. We had not received God's mercy, but now we have received his mercy. And so let me summarize everything we've been talking about this morning. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the living stone who is precious to God and precious to us, to those who believe the message. And because he is precious to us, we embrace his people. And so we become living stones who are being built into this spiritual house. And as this spiritual house, we are a holy priesthood, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And our purpose, the reason we exist, he says it right there in verses 9 and 10, is so that we may declare, do what we're doing right now, but do what you do every day of your life. Declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into God's wonderful light. That's what we exist for. And so let me ask you, do you exist to declare the praises of God? Yes, I love that. You can't do it alone. If you take anything from this text, take, take that you cannot do it alone. This text has been painstakingly and repeatedly making the case that we stand or fall in our identity as Christians with the people of God. This text does not say you individual Christian are a priest. The, the New Testament never calls one person a priest. Rather, you, the body of Christ, are a priesthood. A nation, a new race, a chosen possession, a precious possession. These are all collective nouns. Each one of us as individuals are viewed as a single entity 
as the body of Christ. And so when people say, I love Jesus, but not the church, they don't understand that biblically, you can love Jesus and not love the church. If Jesus is precious to you, so are his people. If Jesus is precious to you, so are his people, which is why we are restarting membership in the church. The logic of membership is simple. Jesus is precious to God. There is no one in the whole universe that is more important to God than Jesus Christ. He is the savior who came down to save us. He died for our sins. He rose to give us new life. No one is as precious as Jesus to God. And because he's precious to us, we become his people and we embrace his people. We embrace that we are a holy priesthood, a holy, uh, a royal priesthood, uh, a, a, a special possession of God's, a chosen race. We embrace this. But if we don't embrace his people, we're not living stones. We are rolling stones. We're stones on a heap with little beauty or purpose. We are weak stones without the scale of a larger building project. We are lonely stones without support or connection. But if we embrace his people, then, then we're members of the church. Then we say, church, the church matters. Listen, membership matters because the church matters. Membership is our way of saying, I belong to the people of the Messiah, Jesus. My life is about declaring his praises and offering sacrifices to my God. And I cannot do that alone. And so that's what we do when we are committing ourselves to the people of God. And I want you to wrestle with that statement. I want you to wrestle with it. If Jesus is precious to you, so are his people. If his people are not precious to you, then you should question whether Jesus is really as precious to you as you say he is. But if they are precious to you, then membership is simply you committing to his people, formalizing your love, you're building his church. Listen, there's only one building project God is doing in all the world. Are you giving your everything to it? When we come here every Sunday, it's more important to us than anything else, to lift his name high, when we go into those classrooms to serve the children, when we attend faithfully our live groups or lead our live groups, when we serve and do the things, whether it's the coffee or the piano or anything else, when we go to Cody to serve the young people there, when we go to other countries to bring the love of Christ, when we do all the different things that we do as the body of Christ, we are living stones. We're building his church. There is only two options when it comes to the Messiah, Jesus. Either we're standing on him or we are stumbling on him. There is no third way. If you reject him, he will make you fall. A stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Come to him. Come to the living stone and embrace his people. Let's pray. Whoa, Lord Jesus. Um, that was a lot. This text of scripture is so rich. I pray you help us to digest it. And I pray that you would use it, God, to grow for each one of us, our identity as yours and with your people. It's the only way that in this exile on this earth, we will make it to you, God. We love you. We love you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, the living stone, who is precious to you, God, and precious to us, Jesus Christ. Amen.